Well, hello again, everyone. It's, of course, time for a new channel update because there's a little bit of a shuffling around of certain things. Some things are kind of on schedule, things aren't quite on schedule, things kind of jumbled up, and just some things to discuss in general. So, guys, want to at least tell you, as I always do, just kind of quick recap of things on the channel here, what we put out recently, which I'm struggling to remember. Okay, we put out the Night of the Creeps commentary, we put out the Conjuring 2 commentary. Got those out, really fantastic. Me and Steve will be recording new commentaries for July on Sunday. Now this is our Scott Derrickson double feature because his birthday lands right in the middle of July. I believe it's the 16th. So I figured we had both Sinister and Black Phone kind of swirling around just trying to find a date for it and Steve's always looking for those little ins and stuff like that. So we found out perfect time to do it. A birthday double feature for the guy. So. No feature for him and Ethan Hawk in that regard. And so we'll be recording those on Sunday and getting them out as things roll on in that regard. I did finally get a video done, a new, brand new review video and stuff like that done for the uh, film The Fallen, starring Denzel Washington. And I felt it came out very well. There was a lot of positive feedback on the whole thing. I did encounter someone who was having a very a lengthy diatribe to a certain degree about things. Their comments aren't there anymore. I hit the person for the channel, wherever the case is. It was just one of those things. I woke up on Sunday and I started trying, because the night before was okay, I tried to engage, as we try to do around here, see like, okay, if there's a discourse or something else, some of the points people want to bring up and discuss and stuff like that, maybe we didn't hit in some places. We'd like to at least bring it up and kind of go off on discourse, but the, the thing was just making me in a really bad situation. It was just, it was really ruining my day, this entire interaction. So I had to brush it under the, the rug and not look at it anymore and just have it gone, I had to be, make it gone. So these, these things happen. As I, I follow a lot of people on social media that run YouTube channels and every so often they got a commenter that's talking some bullshit and they're making all types of ins and outs about things that are just, not even knowing even know where they're coming up with this stuff. And oh, we all have our different ways of dealing with things. Sometimes they'll put it up on Twitter or whatnot or Blue Sky, where the hell it is, and just have a discourse about it and just kind of vent it out in some place here and there. I just like, okay, I, I need to deal with this shit. It's making my day real, real fucking sour. It ain't going well in this whole thing. And this was after the day where I just did all my prep for my next video. And then I get to this whole thing, and that really just drove my entire, started to make, drive my day in a really sour place. Ultimately, haven't gotten the video produced yet. I've kind of brushed it off to the next weekend. And uh, things were off in different directions. And like, sometimes someone, I'm fine with people having a discourse. We're fine with having discussions with different people and stuff like that. But if you're going to go off on a diatribe and put on like a dozen fucking comments below, just like comment after comment after comment, and just turn it into a whole ranting thing uh, it's, it's not it's not it's not worth my time it was a review video so it's mainly me but if it's something on the commentary or something like that and someone's going on and on <laughs> just not gonna deal with this shit we got better things to deal with we got th think of our own sort of mental well-being in the whole thing and so i just divorced myself from the whole thing and just got rid of it from from sight and everything like that so <laughs> there was that and so that kind of shifted my entire back half of my weekend off in bad ways and whatnot. Things went off. Th one thing happened that made everything better. Just turn, started turning the entire day around where I wasn't committing to doing anything else like that. But it was just like it just flipped the entire thing the other way. And a few things here and there, as you probably seen on some things I've mentioned here and there. I'm a big fan of actress Kristen Ritter. I think she's fabulous. I love Jessica Jones so much. That character, the series, all that stuff. That's a very much the entire tone and vibe of that series. And so much of what she did with that character and so many things really has driven a lot of the scripts I've kind of thrown around or whatnot over on and off over the last several years. Doing like well, female protagonist type of stuff that's new and noir and stuff like that here and there. So that's really kind of driven a lot of things. And I've just gravitated towards her in like night books on Netflix. I again did the, went through the entire Audible original she did with like Anthony Mackie and various other fabulous voice actors called Hunting Game. 
that was great too. And I, I was following her on Instagram, and she was filming this brand new movie called Stone Cold Fox. It's pretty like an 80s set sort of serial killer retro film or whatnot. Like this is right in my wheelhouse so much. I was just following all the stuff, and she was posting about it, like filming it just wrapped and everything. I just made a post just saying how much I was a big fan and I re represent Jessica Jones and night books on my walls or whatnot and all these different things. And I've noticed in her Instagram stories that she does share a lot of different posts from a lot of other people, photos of her, stuff like that. She follows a lot of fan accounts that she's very much kind of like very supportive of that type of thing. She's very inviting of that type of stuff. So she very, very much supports a lot of those fan accounts that really kind of celebrate her. So she's very, she's very much appreciative of it. And she did like on my comment after I got home, after running errands and stuff like that, not feeling terribly positive dealing with this entire situation on the comment section. Something like that just, just made my day so much better. It's like someone I admire so much. Her talent is, I started watching a whole bunch of interviews with her and she's delightful. She's a wonderful type of person. Always very ambitious and creative. She's a, she does knitting. She wrote a book. She, she's got her own production company and she's always branching out and striving to do other different things. I signed up for AMC Plus. They kind of watched her Orphan Black Echoes spinoff series because I missed the first episode. But I, I set the DVR for everything else. But I, got, I, I set the DVR after we got episode two, <laughs> right before episode two dropped. So I had to go, okay, I'll sign up for the, the free week trial and just watch the first episode and then get everything else on the DVR and everything like that. But I just, I'm just so gravitate towards her and her energy and her talent and stuff like that and just just her probably going through the comments and reading everything and hitting a like here and there and everything it just turned everything around because i'm just such a fan of what she does and what she so much of what she's done has inspired me doing different things and just it just flipped the light on on the, the rest of the day just some of the stuff was still creeping in here and there but it was like that that gave me the upward trajectory throughout the rest of my day to make me feel good about myself after I spent so much time on Saturday doing a lot of the prep work for the entire video, doing a lot of things here to kind of like refresh the room and do things, kind of rearrange things to get the fresh energies in here and things just didn't go off well the next day dealing with that little comment section situation. And so just that, just that little freaking thing for someone you really admire just flipped everything around. So I very much deeply appreciate her taking that time to give that appreciation, that time and attention to her fans. That means a lot. That means so damn much. So that's a big type of thing. And uh, that kind of segues a little bit into the, the short, uh, short film project that we're kind of, kind of stirring up a little bit. It's not quite going as fast as intended. The one that I uh, wrote, finished writing right around the beginning of the year. I, I finished writing it on New Year's Day and then I kind of took some time off for it, then went back, kind of did some touch-ups here and there, and in that last couple of months I've been intending to get around to making it a reality, but it was just kind of, a lot of things just got in the way in the whole thing, but I recently started getting some ideas about maybe, I want to do things right, because a lot of times in the past I did a lot of things kind of run and gun, guerrilla type of stuff, and didn't organize things very well as production, and things didn't get like proper, like, just kind of do it at guerrilla shot shoot in a in a location and trying to hope we get it done and stuff like that. Want to kind of avoid that. Want to do proper planning, see what we can get, negotiate some things here and there, and try to figure out what we're going to do for crew. I want, I want to deal with trying to get the logistics done of locations and figure out who we get involved with the crew first before I start trying to court actors. Because if I get actors, but then we everything else falls through, it's no damn good. So I want to get all the other kind of things in line with what we can do, when we can do it, where we can do it, and who's involved in that regard, and then we can move forward, see if I can get some actors involved, and see where things move from that point onward. So, just the thing, I'm just trying to work it in a way that, that is beneficial to the time everyone's going to put into this whole thing. So, again, it is a, a neo-noir detective thriller. Very much kind of, obviously the Jessica Jones thing is very much an influence in that regard, but I was watching stuff like When a Stranger Calls Back, and a couple other things. I put together a nice little cinematography mood reference reel that I sent out to Steve and my friend Eric Waltman, cinematographer that I worked with many times before, to just give them an idea of 
what it should look like, how it should feel, how the cinematography should kind of come off when you're reading through the script and everything like that. So a lot of different things in that regard kind of hit off in that regard. And like even like a couple months ago, I watched uh, A Walk Among the Tombstones, Liam Neeson flick. That was very much, I loved that damn thing 10 years ago. Still love it today. And that kind of still kind of tapped into a little of those real tense vibes. Whatnot. Like there's supposed to be a little bit of an element of horror in the whole thing. Just a little bit more towards that in that regard than what I did before with like The Fixer or something else like that, which was more of a dramatic type of film. This one has much more of those suspense elements to it overall. So kind of dealing with some of the same sort of subject matter I have before, but kind of laying in some other character elements there because my thing is so much character. I see a lot of short films that are very much concept based, but there's not really, there's no real character. And that's fine because I mean, when you're trying to make a short film, it's got to be short and snappy and stuff like that, get to the point of certain things. So it's kind of hard to develop character and theme when you're kind of punching for five to 10 minutes at the most or whatnot. So it's kind of a difficult type of thing, but that's my, that's what I write. I write characters. I like in developing a character that I can latch on to. It's like concepts. Okay. But I need something, I need some substance there to go through the entire story. I need a little bit of an arc to a certain degree to make things feel like they have a, a weight to myself. I'm writing something that feels not just a simple little concept that kind of goes off in a certain way. I want to have it stand up with a little bit more weight to it, kind of a little bit of a heft to it without bogging it down to a certain degree. So that's a very difficult sort of balance and, and mixture or whatnot to kind of weave in together to not, not make it too expository heavy, but also keep things on a certain level that feels like you can understand what's going through on the emotion of the story and the characters, what they're dealing with and where things lead towards the climax of the whole thing. So I felt like this one, this script has kind of hit that balance overall. And so I very much feel like it can, it's a doable script. I just have to get the right things in line to make sure it can happen. So we'll see where it goes. Now, right now the entire title of the thing is called In Too Close. So I've kind of settled on that title after Steve. A couple of months ago, I was like, I was, couldn't figure out a title for the whole thing. And he kind of had the idea of like, usually when he's working on something, something like that and trying to find that element of the entire script to kind of like go through the dialogue and try to find something in the dialogue that kind of encapsulates what you're going for. And so I found that pretty much in like the first scene or so of the entire script and kind of like, yeah, that works. That kind of works or whatnot. So I, I, I've, I've settled on that at this point in time. So that's your things there at that point. As I mentioned, the, the, the next video I was planning to do was for Michael Mann's The Insider. And that's the thing I was prepping for. Minor other thing that I'll mention, I'll probably just bring it up now before I get to the log off thing. I did get the soundtrack for the whole thing. I got it off of eBay. Really easy. A lot of copies up there, but like I, I mentioned before, I've got it. It was, it was up on iTunes, but aside from Manhunter, which I did buy in iTunes because I never saw a CD lurking around anywhere. All my other man soundtracks are on CD. I've got the one for Thief. I've got another one I got grabbed up. I got Heat. I've got Collateral. I've got this. I've got Miami Vice. So I think every one that I have on Blu-ray, I now have a physical CD for. And of course, Manhunter on top of that as well because I got the old Screen Factory release. Man is manded. Say that he is planning to work on a 4K of that. We'll see how that work goes, but. He did back, we just mentioned it in one of the commentaries, that he, um, I know, at the American Cinematheque, I got it wrong on the commentary, but it was American Cinematheque, he actually screened his own personal 70 millimeter print of Manhunter. So he apparently got a lot of these things. He's got an archival one for the Insider. I saw he did a screening of it back in like 2019 for the 20th anniversary. He's got that. He's got a few other ones. I think he might have one. I know he has an answer print for Thief because they use that to grade the Criterion version for it. So he's got a lot of these archival things. A lot of the fact was a lot of DGA stuff. You would typically get your own answer print or something else like that. And I think for the Insider, it was the fact that he had a show print for it. So as I was digging around for information, I stumbled across information in that regard. And so a lot of these different things. So I, Insider is still planned. I just, after certain things over the weekend, I just felt like I need to, I need to take a break, relax, decompress, go make for a busier weekend because I'll have, 
if I'm going to keep go forward with it, I'm going to have to shoot it on Saturday, then turn around and do the commentaries and Sunday afternoon and whatnot with Steve. But I'll make sure I get through things because we'll get through things. But anything like that, it's going to be a long one. You probably see it on the timeline. It's probably going to be a long one. But I, I decided I, I needed some structure, so I put together a little <laughs> cheat sheet on my uh, notes app or whatnot. But a uh, quick little short thing, as I mentioned, my friend Amy Cooney Ames. That uh, I do a lot of things with her to triple shoot a lot of her music distribution stuff. When a lot of things like the name Ames, it's been kind of used for a lot of different artists here and there. So sometimes someone else's stuff gets dumped on her artist page or her stuff gets clumped in somewhere else. So most streaming services I've been able to kind of go off and use, whether their own services, their own like toolbox or dashboard or whatnot, or her own stuff on her own distribution and or whatnot to kind of go in and clean things up and get things separated and move things off. So I keep a tab on that whole thing. But this past <clears throat> this past month, I actually pitched sure it's like, okay, it's been about two years since we updated the Wikipedia. And so I went in and updated all her singles on the whole thing. I up, She sent a whole bunch of different little notes about different things that she's gone off and done, certain like songwriting collaborations she's done, certain things here and there. So I went off and did some updates on the whole thing, kind of refined some older pieces of the whole thing, and she was so pleased about everything. I put in a lot of good work on the whole deal there to kind of edit it, kind of get it up to specs, and clean up a few little things here and there, just make it overall consistent, the formatting and stuff like that. So I just absolutely love doing things for her. I went through and got some new stuff added to her YouTube channel in terms of like some interviews or whatnot she did here and there on... Uh, She's uh, very much heavy into the Warrior Nun Netflix show uh, fandom because she su submitted a song that got featured in the show. And so the, the entire fan base is so much glommed around her and stuff like that. So she was on one of the um, YouTube channels they have. She was doing an entire, like, almost like an entire master class or whatnot, a sort of a lecture or whatnot about her songwriting and how she goes about different things because she teaches at the UCLA Herb Albert School of Music. She teaches songwriting there, and she was doing the whole thing last summer on, on their channel for about an hour, and I threw that up on her entire interviews and live performances playlist. So definitely, guys, I just, I think the world of her, she's one of the most beautiful people I know as a, as a beautiful soul of a person because her music is so from her heart, from her soul. She speaks so well of different things, and we're so we are, we are pretty close. We share a lot of different things about what, what's going on in our lives, the highs and lows, stuff like that. We kind of help each other, kind of lift each other up and kind of do things in that regard. So we, we've been friends for like five years now. Uh, I discovered her stuff late 2018 and we just kind of eventually, random series of events just got to the point where we were just like came to this point and whatnot. And through tough times the last couple of years or whatnot, we've kind of helped our, each other through a little bit with a few words here and there, just in trading emails and stuff like that. But she's one of the best people I know, and I'm just so glad to be helping her out with this stuff. And she compensates me for it. She pays me a fee for everything like that, an hourly rate or whatnot for everything I do for her. And she's so absolutely thankful because she does. she's an independent artist. She does, she publishes and all that type of stuff, her music herself, she produces it more or less on her own. She doesn't have a label or anything like that. She was attached to a label for a short time, for about, about, maybe about two years or so, but as the pandemic hit and everything was locked down, the, the entire thing kind of dissolved. And so she went back to doing everything independently. So having someone like myself to actually look out for all these different things, kind of troubleshoot all these little things while she's off doing all these different things, the classes and doing other songwriting collaborations and various other things and trying to work her own music, it's a lot of stuff. So when I have downtime, I kind of think about different things to kind of look out for and just troubleshoot different things and so on and so forth. So guys, always, there's going to, as I talk about many of the other things, links in the description, go check her out on here on YouTube, YouTube Music, stuff like that. She does have a link tree that I helped, helped uh, turn her on to. So I'll probably post that below where you can grab her on a few different platforms if you want to check her stuff out. But she originally had a song that got featured in The Good Doctor in the final season of that called uh, How to Say Goodbye. And I absolutely love the track. It's fabulous. So go check her stuff out absolutely positively. And uh, moving on from that, we're talking a couple of shows and some comics and stuff like that. So 
This week, I'm getting a lot of Netflix. I'm just watching Netflix this week. Because one, the new season of Star Trek Prodigy has dropped. All 20 episodes. They're about 25 minutes apiece. They're about... I watched the first five episodes last night. And this is just absolutely fabulous. God damn. I, I want... When it dropped on Netflix earlier this year for season one, I watched it through and I talked about it here. I thought it was just magnificently well done. Just, it's such a great show. The writing is so good. You could tell this from people who love Trek and use this as a sort of like inroad for people who, who are not even watching Trek before, not really all that much in. It's rewarding for the people who are Trekkers. But people who have not been introduced before, it's a wonderful like bringing the kids into Star Trek type of thing. It explains things, but doesn't do it so bogged down or heavy-handed or something else like that. It's a nice introductory type of thing that lays all the seeds out. Wonderful characters. The animation is spectacular. And it's getting through the first quarter of this season. I didn't want to stop last night, but it got late enough. But I can't. Get, I was going to just like watch the first episode. Then I kind of stopped. Then I went off another watch a couple episodes. And it's like I kept going back. It's like I couldn't stop because it was so goddamn good. So I'm going to be watching... On the 4th, I'll probably watch a little bit more uh, like tomorrow night that into the 4th. I'll be finishing the whole thing up. Plus, we got the new Beverly Hills Cop movie coming up on Netflix. Axel F. I'm going to sit down and watch it. I'm going to watch that type of thing. I don't know if we're going to do a video or, or we're going to do a commentary or something else like that. If we do a commentary, it'll probably be more like 6 months down the road where people have really gotten the time to watch it. Or they kind of get into it. We'll see. We'll see. Nothing's for certain. I'm just talking about this off the cuff and whatnot. But one, you got to check out the, the track they released for the soundtrack that Lauren Balfe did, along with Tim Capello, the sax guy from the Lost Boys, who was Tina Turner's saxophonist back in the 80s. Oh, this track. This thing sizzles. Woo! It's the 80s on fucking fire, man. You gotta, you gotta check this track out. It's a, you can, you can pick up a little bit of the whole Harold Faltermeyer, Beverly Hills Cop two cues right at the beginning of the whole thing, but then it just launches off. I can't wait to see how they integrate this into their movie. I'm just burning up on this whole thing. And La La Land Records is going to release a limited edition CD of it, so that's cool. So if this thing goes up hot, hot enough. We'll see about that. We'll see if I grab that thing because I saw my friend Oliver on Twitter. He was like, he was gushing about that. And I checked it. I was like, oh my god, holy hell! So that's that's gave me some goodwill for the entire film. And uh, I saw a couple of people. I saw uh, Matthew Buck, Film Braid. He was posting about he. I guess he might have got because uh, he's over in the UK. He probably got it just a little bit ahead of everyone else here on the US side. And he said it's pretty good. I think more or less pretty, pretty much every, it's pretty good. It's a likable film. It, it's it just it, it's endearing. It's charming and whatnot. I, I I think it's good. I think I like the trailer. I think the trailer looks good. Got some good talent in the whole thing. You got Bronson Pinchot back. Paul Reiser's back. You got uh, John Ashton back as Taggart. Great type of thing. Trinol's not looking too great these days. I thought Ashton looked better. Ashton is he's up there in age. I think he's close to like late seventy or something like that maybe 80 or something like that, but he looks right for his age. Rhino looks a little rough, but they also got uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and the whole thing. I think Kevin, is Kevin Bacon the, I'm going to have to look it up. I think Kevin Bacon's the bad guy in the whole film, which would be fucking badass. Yeah, he, yeah. Yeah, so he's badass in the whole thing. He's going to be a badass. It's a good cast. I'm, look, I'm liking the cast. I'm liking the score. It's got some goodwill going for it. So I'll be again, watching some more Prodigy tomorrow night. Then I'll finish it up on Thursday, and then I'm going to watch Axel F and everything like that, and I should hopefully be having a great time. So that's the way I'm spending my holiday. Up on Netflix all damn day, having a good time. It's going to be good shit. So there's that. And uh, I did just fi finish up a month on the Disney Plus Hulu bundle in that regard, because I thought about X-Men 97 before. I have some more X-Men stuff to talk about. But I also watched The Veil which is an FX series up on Hulu from FX production networks and whatnot. And this is great. Elizabeth Moss. I mean, she's an incredible actress. But this was, I, I watched the trailer for this thing. It's like, it's an espionage type of show that's a lot of like smoke and mirrors, the seat type of thing. I thought it was fantastic. It was a, a six episode limited series. 
And it was it started out like wide scope type of terrorist plot that you're trying to have this agent go in and try to subversively try to figure out exactly who's who and try to, a lot of spy craft type of things. Not like Bond or Born or whatnot, but it's like much more realistic type of things as someone going in there with an assumed identity and playing things to try to suss out the truth and the details of what's happening when and who's who's the threat and all of the different things. Just all that really kind of interesting machinations because you got like the French government, the MI6 from the UK, you got the CIA dealing with things like all these different organizations kind of pushing back against one another and playing all these kind of political games with one another, trying to see who's got the upper hand and trying to play off here and there and who's got a strong arm or, strong arm or something like that. Just like wonderful cast, incredible type of stuff. There's some heavy stuff in the whole thing as well. There's some definite like real life stuff that makes you a little bit too scared. But the drama, the character work, everything is so goddamn good. The cinematography is magnificent the whole thing again one thing steve always brought up was like if you got the if you got the scenery it's hard to get it wrong but sometimes you just gotta say the craft there is just impeccable but i thought this thing just went from wide scope type of things and just narrowed it down much more upon elizabeth moss's mi6 character to delve deeper into who she is what made her who she is and the people around her that kind of influenced and impacted her life and stuff like that and it's all wrapped up in this espionage political terrorist type of things it was just a rock solid show rock solid definitely just if you're up for the entire subject matter it's a killer show killer killer thing i just like this is great i to throw in subtitles every so often and kind of track things back because uh, some of the dialogue got a little mumbled here and there at certain points in time not not regularly but there's some points here and there and stuff like that but regardless i thought the production quality they, 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 they don't have it heavy all the time because i love the the main cia guy because they made him as as american as fuck <laughs> and he was entertaining in that regard doesn't throw the tone off but he makes a certain dynamic that's different from a lot of different things in the film just makes him so much like a cowboy in a certain way, like a modern cowboy attitude, the whole thing. So I love them. It was a great character. They do all, all the great things and explore things. It's great. It's a great show. Just check it out if you want to. But uh, <laughs> I gotta get back to my notes app. But uh, beyond that, so we're transitioning off that. I've ended that. I'm going to probably go back to after this week, once I get through all the Netflix stuff, I'll probably go back up on Paramount Plus and kind of get back into my other Star Trek shows. Because I keep wanting to eventually buy Enterprise on Blu-ray, the full, complete series. I was like, I keep waiting, waiting for the price to kind of get down to a, kind of a bargain. A little bit of a bargain. And it never quite, get, quite gets there. So it's like, I've been waiting about six or so months. And so I figure, okay, I'm going to go back up on Paramount Plus and watch the rest of Enterprise I need to. And probably more properly go through strange new worlds i've got i've done a couple episodes here and there just never really just sh shot through the seasons and whatnot so i'll probably work my way through that as well so all that type of stuff but uh, anyway as i was as i did the x-men 97 thing at the last update and um <clears throat> it was fan fan phenomenal just killer type of thing I'd watch it again. I watched both these series on Hulu and, and Disney Plus all over again, no problem. But I got to that, and then it's like a, a little while later, it's like I wanted to watch, I wanted to watch a Gambit episode from the original animated series, and of course the one to go to would be externally yours, because I think that's one only one that's really kind of centered on him and kind of his backstory and where he came from and stuff like that. And after that. I'm just hooked on the vibe of Gambit and Rogue 100 goddamn percent, like thoroughly, like for weeks now, just like, just like hooked on those two is like my spirit animals right now. So thankfully I have the original Gambit miniseries from the nineties, from about 94 or so. So I read through the entire four issues and this is really good. This is good. I rate, I rank, rated about four and a half out of five up on my uh, camera. League of Comic Geeks app because this really just hit the spot. I mean, it has Gambit going back. It's kind of a, a lot of the same similar material as that episode from the series, 
but it's, it's a different plot. But it's still him going back to New Orleans, dealing with guilds, the thief, thieves' guild, the assassins' guild. But it's much more, more complex, more compl, not really complicated story, but it's more expansive story. A lot more things going on the whole thing, and not exactly the same plot, but some of the similar elements in that regard. And of course, Rogue comes along with him, and she has her own plot dealing with her sort of longing for for Remy and everything like that. Because just those two together. I love the. I, I, I was looking around at what whatnot on various things, looking into them. They have gotten married in the comics. It's like it had to happen. They're too fabulous. They're too fabulous together to not. And just like this is this is just such good. I, I love the fact that I, I I picked this stuff up. It's where I got the this sort of embossed sort of lenticular. I don't know embossed foil cover or whatnot. It just that, that's great. I just got these. 100% right when they came out. And I don't remember if I actually read them at the time because there was a lot of stuff I was picking up I never really got through. But reading this thing now, I just thought it was fantastic. The only thing I had a little bit only issue with it, just sort of the, some of the layouts of the, sort of the text boxes and the dialogue boxes are a little hard to follow sometimes because you'll have like one thing up here but then that one down here and then another one up here. It's like I'm trying to figure out exactly which direction I'm supposed to be reading everything in. So... A little bit of the laid out and st stuff like that. And some of the little speech bubbles are a little bit crammed in. And so they got like a partial word and then hyphen in the next line. I think I, I figure probably today they probably have a little bit better laid out in that regard. But I think that I believe there was a uh, collected edition of this or whatnot. I don't know if it's still in print. But uh, anything like that. If there's something up on Marvel stuff where they got digital comics. I definitely, definitely, definitely say go check this out. If you love Ro Gambit, Rogue or whatnot. This is definitely... A great type of thing, having him deal with that entire thing. It's a good arc. It's a really good arc all over the place. I really was very impressed by everything in this whole thing. And uh, <clears throat> I wasn't really, I don't think I was really familiar with the names on it too much. Let me grab a uh, story by Howard Matchy, art by Lee Weeks. Lee Weeks is one I kind of recall what that inks by Klaus Jansen. So some of the art's pretty. Pretty impressive this whole thing. So there was some other stuff I think in the last issue. I won't draw this too long. I just find one or two pieces of the whole thing. But uh, there's some really good like layouts and the whole thing because I couldn't find any, any like <laughs> scans or whatnot in a quick way or whatnot when I was looking through the whole thing before online. But uh, anything like that is just really just came off as a really satisfying read in that regard so it was on issue three but there's some really really good layouts on the whole thing that i was very much impressed with so <laughs> so i'm like <clears throat> gonna go off this entire thing where rogue kind of gets this surge of someone else's memories and just it's a wonderful just conglomeration of layouts and various other things and this just uh, just if you read through it, it just the layouts really kind of kick so strongly. They really just do. But uh, <laughs> let's move on now as we get into the media pickups. Finally, doing a little bit of a different format in this whole thing. But uh, main thing is, I got the Warnings' brand new album, "Keep Me Fed." This is the first physical copy I've gotten. It. I just moved the tripod with my foot. Anyway, I just, this is the, the first physical copy I've gotten of one of their albums. Because everything else I got up on iTunes. But I felt like, yeah, I'm this hot on them. I want to start getting the physical disc and whatnot. And fortunately, I ordered from Bull Moose. And it took a little longer to get to things than I hoped for. Because I didn't get this till Monday. And the thing got released on, on Friday. So I'm starting to think I'm going to start ordering these things direct from the actual artist website. So I can maybe kind of get them a little bit faster in that regard. So anything like that, this thing kills. Oh my God. Apparently like the, the producer there working with the whole thing, he was really pushing them out of their comfort zone and they're just like ripping the hell out of these songs. And they're all like real kind of like punchy, like three plus minute songs, everything like that. There's no like big long epics or opuses or anything like that. This thing just rips from start to finish. Ali's bass is so just thick on this whole damn thing. Oh my lord. Just, this thing kills. This album kills like hell. It's just, you can tell. 
they're shooting through the stratosphere now. I mean, the last the last seven was one that was like the revelation because the production quality just took a major leap forward. But this one, they're just pushing it up even further beyond what they did before. Oh my God, the songs are just ripping all over the place. Just, just excellent, just excellent stuff. So much so. They are coming to the Chicago suburbs, but for Riot Fest. And unfortunately, I looked at the tickets and they're like $100 plus a piece. <laughs> Long way from when I used to go to OzFest and these things would cost you like fucking nothing, next to nothing, like maybe like 30, 40 bucks to go up on the lawn seats. Nothing. Nothing back then, but it's been a long time since then, and they got a lot of bands on the whole thing. Like, it's not worth it to go to see one or two bands, because, like, they always had Rival Sons on the entire uh, lineup and whatnot. I was like, I'm fine to see the Rival Sons again if they're playing on the same day. I haven't seen them in fucking ages, but I, I, I dig their music to a certain degree. But it's like, for one or two bands, it's not worth it, because, like, what, well, they're going to play, like, a 30, 40-minute set? It's not worth it paying, like, 130, 40 bucks or whatnot. So... They don't have any other dates around here on the current list of tour dates. They're going through like another European tour. They're going to do some North, North America dates here, Canada, Mexico, stuff like that here and there and everywhere. So probably maybe it's late, very late in the year or maybe swing around back at the beginning of next year. We'll see where things go off in that regard. But the fact is between getting this, this the physical CD of this and the one from Plush, Find the Beautiful, my two favorite modern rock bands and they're both complete female bands. They're kicking the hell out of it. Awesome type of stuff. Just like they got such a great vibe. They're bands who get to, who are friends and stuff like that. They toured together before last year. Hopefully it'll happen again. So if they come around here, both bands, you know, that'd be just the dream for me at this point in time. Seeing these two bands just launching off in that regard and just building so much off of what they've already done before. Plus just, I thought the, the EP they put out this year, just, it's just a major step forward in developing their sound, the production quality, just finding different qualities that they can just accentuate themselves into the sound overall. And that's the exact same thing with the warning right now. Right now. They're, they're such young bands, but they're, they, they've got so much ahead of them and they're so absolutely fantastic. So there's that. And uh, a few other soundtracks that, that I picked up. One is all very topical. I picked up Beverly Hills Cop 2 soundtrack because there's a there's a thrift store nearby and they sell the, all the CDs for one dollar so what I didn't know I just kind of went in there kind of looking around trying to find whatever but it's like if you got soundtracks I'll look through all your soundtracks I'll look through anything to find something I don't even know is out there and they had a ton of stuff but I only found this one because I think it was for the longest time they did not have this soundtrack up on like digital platform, probably from licensing or whatnot, but apparently it's there now. You can get certain songs, but only if you buy the entire album, like as we mentioned in our old commentary, Better Way from James Ingram, which is the main track I wanted to get the whole thing. You have to buy the whole album up on iTunes to get it. And the fact that the, the fact is when I found this, I didn't even know it was up on digital. I didn't figure that out until afterwards when I was posting it on social media. But it's fantastic. And the fact that I got shakedown on this whole thing, because I a long time ago I bought my dad the uh Bob Seeger Ultimate Hits compilation, but apparently it's one of those things where they really kinda almost brick wall the whole thing. It's really kinda peaked out to a certain degree. But since there's the original pressing and all that type of stuff, the original album was put out on, I compared the waveforms. This one a lot looked a lot more pleasing to the ears. So nice to have that. I just ripped the whole thing. So various other things on this whole thing. So just, it's a great soundtrack. And speaking of Michael Mann, they also had the Last Mohicans soundtrack as well. So like I've said, everyone I have on Blu-ray, I believe I have the soundtrack for it now. So I haven't even watched Last of the Mohicans, but I grabbed it on Blu-ray last year just because I was a little bit on the Battle and So Kick after I did the review for Blink about a year and a half ago. And I figured, I'd, you know, I had it on DVD before, but I felt like, yeah, just fucking get the goddamn Blu-ray. I'll eventually get around to watching it at some point in time. And I've already familiar with at least one track of this whole thing. And uh, I just had to get it. For a buck. For a buck. Come on. For a buck. And, bigger thing to talk about, I got the 4K of Purple Rain. I had to get it. 
It was a whole thing. I love this film. I absolutely love it. I know there's flaws in the whole thing. There's certain things, but, but when this first came to special edition DVD 20 years ago, I watched this. I don't know how many weeks, but for, for weeks on end, I made a requirement to watch it once per week. That's how much I was up on this whole thing between the soundtrack and everything else. I really, really love this film. And the thing, this 4K is fabulous. Oh my God. I know Warren Brothers has got... Sometimes they're excellent and sometimes they really botched the job. This, they nailed it. They did an 8K restoration. 8K restoration. And they did a new 5.1 surround mix and it sounds fantastic. Because, uh... Apparently, like, the, the old 5.1 was, like, one of those early DVD remixes where it's, like, all... Oh, it says it's a 5.1, but it's all just kind of, like, front-heavy type of stuff. There's not really any action in the surrounds. This, they do a lot of good things with the concert stuff in the film. When they're in the First Avenue stuff, they got the crowd noises to the surround channels in the back, and the, the music sounds punchy. It's really goddamn good. It's alive. It's so goddamn good. I just, like... It was just good. It was just really just fantastic. It looks fucking great. The disc only has HDR10. I'm sure probably the digital copy has Adobe Vision. But on the disc, they just got that. They did not port over all the bonus features, unfortunately. So I'm keeping my old re uh, previous remastered Blu-ray, which was off of the 2K scan of the Interpositive. This one kills it. Absolutely. And though there was, there's at least one scene in the film, where if, you, if you've seen the film a couple of times, you know exactly where it is. Or Clarence Wins the third and and the the wife barge into the kids uh, loft in the basement or whatnot. At a certain point in time, the, the quality of the footage shifts into something that's much darker, much kind of grimier because they apparently had lost the actual film elements while they're actually producing the film, and they had to kind of work off probably like a work print element or whatnot or whatever it was like the dailies. So they did the best they they've always apparently kind of done the best they could with that quality of footage, but it's still noticeable. But anything else in the film, the stage lighting looks absolutely gorgeous. Oh my God. So much. This thing, grab it. If you like the film, grab it. Absolutely. It's fantastic. No regular uh, Blu-ray disc in the whole thing, but uh, just a 4K in the digital copy. But goddamn, this, this, oh my God. I love this film and it looked and sounded so goddamn good. Oh my God. <laughs> So yeah, if you have your previous uh, special edition DVD or the previous Blu-ray with all the bonus features, keep that so you get all the retrospective stuff, all the interviews. They've got one thing about First Avenue on here, the music videos, the commentary track, I believe. Could just be reading it off the back here, but yeah, that's all they have. The commentary track, the First Avenue uh, Road to Pop Royalty, and the music videos. That's all that's on this thing. So all the stuff that was retrospective about the film's making is not on the 4K, so they kind of picked and chose what they want to put on here, which is unfortunate, but anything like that. So if you have the previous one, hold on to that. Get this damn thing. It's fantastic. But anything. So one thing, uh, uh, two more things. One is the fact that I had, had, as I did that Retro Video Series episode on Jade last year, and I was re-watching it, it was like, here, there, and everywhere, but... I was I was thinking about Sliver. <laughs> it's like fumble things around. I grabbed out the unrated DVD when I was out hunting things around at uh, Half Price Books and stuff like that on an excursion. I found it. It was the only thing I found on the excursion whatsoever. I'm thinking about maybe doing a video on that as well. The same type of same sort of video in that regard because there's a number of thing there's a number of things with with Sliver. It's, it's kind of similar to Jade to a certain degree. How it was handled on. Uh, home home video whatnot. It's from the same company, Paramount. But there's like the DVD has has the wrong aspect ratio. The Blu-ray has the wrong aspect ratio. The laser disc, widescreen laser disc has a correct aspect ratio. But they didn't put the rated version on laser disc, and they haven't put it on Blu-ray. It's only on DVD, and it's a bit of a mess. And there's the entire thing with all the production problems behind the scenes of it. The only problem is. All the unrated ver because I looked up on uh, moviecensorship.com about the differences between the R-rated and unrated, and apparently all the unrated stuff is all the sexy nudity stuff, so I can't put the nude stuff on YouTube. So that's that's my only 
stopgap in making a video on all things, okay? If I'm going to talk about that stuff, I can't show any the footage. All I could do is show, like, the different aspect ratios of the footage. So I'd have to get the laser disc if I'm going to do this. I have, I'm watching, I have one on my eBay watch list right now. It's been sitting up there for weeks. I'm not pulling the trigger on it until I actually sit down and watch the DVD first to see if it's actually worth a damn to actually do the video. So I don't know if that's gonna when it's going to happen. So that's the thought about things. So I haven't watched it yet. There's no bonus features, nothing. It's just the movie and that's it. So, there's barely anything to make anything out of, but it's a thought. It's a thought. I like the, the, the half dozen thoughts I have of Retro Video Series right now. So, I don't know. I'm just throwing things out there, grabbing a thing here and there. And I figure, well, if I... It gets me halfway to the point where I need to get. If I'm going to do a video at least halfway there, if I don't do it, then whatever the fuck. Who cares? I've got the unrated version and the wrong aspect ratio. What else am I going to do about it? But anything like that, I'll get another shot. I'll give it a shot. I watched it a long time ago. I don't remember much about it except for that it was very unremarkable. But I, I think I was watching the UB40 music video. I think that was mainly the thing for Can't Help Falling in Love. And I love the music video. I watched the music video way more than I've ever watched the movie. It's a, it's a great cover of the song. It's, it's good stuff and whatnot. But anything like that. I'm just flowing off a handle in certain regards or whatnot. But that's an idea for the Retro Various Shades along with everything else I have. The closing Cards of the Third Kind thing. The Star Trek The Motion Picture, numerous versions, all these different things that God knows we're going to get around to. At least I have things on a list somewhere. I have ideas I can delve into when I feel like it. So, anything in that regard. And uh, this is getting fairly long here. So, I was going to talk about some other things. I'll make it as brief as possible. There was a CD encoding that was going on between like the late 90s into the 2000s called HDCD. Now this was, you could play it on a regular player and have no problems. It would be the exact same thing you'd get. But if you had a player that could decode the HDCD thing, you would get greater beat, bit depth, and higher dynamic range. And I, I knew about this whole thing because my old, my uh, Stevie Nicks Enchanted Box set, all three discs are encoded HDCD. Now, I couldn't do anything right because not my Blu-ray players or my DV player or anything like that decoded that thing, but apparently there's software you can get that will decode that and rip it to your computer, which I have done with this. I've done with, found out, I had some of my Natalie Merchant CDs. Her second, second and third album and her live album were encoded this way, so I ripped that as well. And since today, as I'm recording this, is Michelle Branch's birthday. Her original demo CD, Broken Bracelet, for some reason, was actually encoded as an HDCD release. None of our stuff, aside from the maxi single for Breathe, was also encoded with HDCD, but nothing else. Not our other thing. This is not Spirit Room, not Hotel Paper, not the record stuff. Nothing else. So this kind of this thing ran for me about 96 or something like that to about 2008 or something like that. Roughly somewhere around there. Apparently Neil Young did a whole bunch of these releases in that regard. He was well on top of that thing. But you can go on, go up on Discogs and kind of do a search to try and find things here and there. Only other thing I had which shows, again, my musical range. That there, that my Motley Crue, Crucial Crew reissue CD of Shout of the Devil was also recorded that way. So, and my, one of my live CDs for Woodstock 99, which I'd almost never listened to, but it has some one or two tracks I care about. It's also encoded that way, but I figured that was such a weird type of thing to have this roughly produced demo CD she put together before she got a real, really signed to a label or whatnot, when she just maybe had an agent and trying to shop things around, that they decided to spring for this HECD encoding. They get greater bit depth and higher dynamic range on, on basically what's a demo CD. So I just found that as a wild coincidence in that regard. So that's all I'm going to say about that. So guys, again, we got the Scott Derrickson double feature recording on Sunday. And hopefully I will get the Insider review actually put together sometime shortly. So I'm not going to guarantee you things, but since I kind of want to take a little time off and kind of decompress and deal with things in my own time, it's been a little bit of a rough week in some places here and there. But anything like that. So hopefully it'll come around shortly. I have all the stuff banked up in my head about everything I've gone through. 
I looked at different things. I looked at a lot of stuff in terms of the real people depicted in the film and stuff they thought about the film, stuff about what really happened. I'm going across a lot of different things, so I'm kind of getting some stuff banked up. And thankfully, and the thankful thing, I don't have to sit through a commentary track to get all the additional information from the two hour and 35 minute film. So that's kind of helpful that I don't have to do that. It's a lot of times, like, a lot of things will have a commentary track. It's like, I just don't have the time to sit through it twice. I don't have time to sit through everything twice. Like, Fallen, I sat through like half the commentary. Then I watched the film several days later for my notes and everything like that. I was like, I, I got, most of the stuff was up on IMDb trivia because it's like, commentary track from like 25 years ago so everyone's kind of detailed the stuff but some of some other things kind of helped out in little pieces here and there about the entire production in that regard but anything in that regard so most times I won't go through the commentary track because it's like I've gotten stuff like for interviews and other stuff on the disc or something else here and there most times I'll kind of forego going to commentary because I just that's like like a whole other like half day I have to put things off when I really don't have the time for it so anything like that so guys that is everything I have. Again, that's a long video. Not really one I really want to keep doing this long, but there's a lot of stuff I really want to talk about. So guys, I hope you've been very much interested in all that type of stuff and enthusiastic. Let me know about all that type of stuff. And uh, thanks very much for checking out the channel, supporting things around here. Super thanks feature, uh, Patreon, all that type of stuff. Liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing if you haven't already. All this stuff does extremely well. And of course, little notification bell to make sure you get notified every time I upload something and make sure it's not unpersonalized because that pretty much means you're never going to get anything. It's a useless feature. I never got anything, never got a notification or anything that was put to personalized. So I had to put on to notify everything or all or whatnot. So that way you'll get everything I put up on here and get a notification on it, you know, a little notification tab or anything like that. So thanks so much guys. Take care. Bye-bye.